Good afternoon. I'm Mark Lawson. More importantly, this is Michael Apted. By tradition, as you know, there uh, is both a television and a film festival at different times in Edinburgh. And Michael Apted is one of the few people who could, by rights, um, appear at either. But in this session, the Richard Dunn Memorial Interview, um, as it is this year, we will reflect his work in both media. On television, we'll be talking about um, Seven Up, which is now 56 Up, um, but also uh, his whole range of work for television, including um, a large amount of fiction, a lot of it with the late Jack Rosenthal, from uh, their early work on Coronation Street to Patang Yang Kipperbang, um, which went out on the first night of Channel 4, and movie work, uh, including um, 007 in the World is Not Enough, um, The Coal Miner's Daughter, uh, and many others. Um, I thought we'd start with what you're actually doing at the moment, the work you've interrupted to come here, because I think it tells us something about a director's life. You're taking a couple of days off from working on Chasing Mavericks, um, based on the life of the surfer Jay Moriarty. And even um, two or three months ago, we wouldn't have expected this to be in your list of credits, but Curtis Hansen was indisposed. Tell us the story. You, you, you took over at very, very short notice. Yeah, uh, I took over, I got a call at Thanksgiving in November and said we were at this trouble on a film that uh, Curtis Hansen was directing it and wasn't well and was having tests done. Would I go in and help out? There was about another month left to shoot. And so I, they emailed me the script and I read and I said, I was just finishing off 56, so I had a bit of time. So I went up there to San Francisco. I was in Florida at the time. And, I saw about an hour of an assemblage, and then that was on a Sunday, and on the Monday I started shooting with locations I'd never seen, actors I'd never met, and a crew I didn't know. <laughs> so it was like those teenage dreams you have when you go into a room to do an exam and you don't know anything. But anyway, so Curtis unfortunately didn't get better, so I've been on the film for the last eight months. Uh, I completed the shooting, which went on quite a bit, and then all the post-production. And what it tells us, um, I think, which will come out throughout this interview, is that it's very hard to plan your life as a director. Yeah. There are a lot of accidents. Um, you have good luck, you have bad luck. And really, that goes back to the very beginning. We're going to start in 1964. I don't know if we'd gone to William Hill then and tried to get <laughs> odds on the fact that um, uh, 48 years later, you'd still be working on this same yeah. documentary project. Um, they, we, we'd probably have got quite good odds against. Uh, but you're still here, and we're going to talk about this whole process. So let's begin with the first clip, which is from 1964 and is from Seven Up. Give me a child until he is seven, and I will give you the man. <laughs> let's get to know these children taking a little sister to school on a London council estate. Jackie. From the Yorkshire Dales. Nicholas. He goes to a one-room village school four miles away from his home. From this Liverpool suburb, we chose Neil. And this is Tony. His girlfriend calls him a monkey. He goes to one of the older schools in the East End of London. One of those little seven-year-olds is actually in this room now, so if you look at the person next to you and then do some quick mental arithmetic <laughs> and um, try to work out which one it is, but when we take questions at the end, you might discover which one um, it is. Uh, it's very unusual in a retrospective with a director to include something they didn't direct, but we obviously have, because that is, um, it's extraordinary what led from that. But just give us a sense of you, you as a young <coughs> researcher on that first mm -hmm. project. What, um, 
What was your attitude towards it? Well, I mean, I just joined Granada in the training program, and they, they couldn't really afford to train us, so it was sort of on the job training. But then there came the point when you had to go do something. And so two of us were put on World in Action, where, so we were immediately in fear and dread of Tim Hewitt, who was running the place, who was a very noisy but brilliant Australian person who had kind of reinvented current affairs on television. So we were you know, living on our nerves, and they had this idea, Tim had this idea to have a look at England in 1963 through the eyes of some seven-year-old children based on the Jesuit thing. Um, that was it, pretty much. Yeah, there was never had any long-term uh, plans at all for it. So anyway, they, we were told that we had to find seven, a group of seven years, and we had three weeks to do it because they were going to start shooting in three weeks. So I did the London end, Gordon did the North Country and Liverpool and the Dales and all that, and we assembled this group. Right? We would ring up education people and say, would you be prepared to let World in Action come in and blah, blah, blah. And eventually they said, yes, yes, yes. So we went along met the teachers, said, show me your brightest seven-year-old. So we did that in a number of schools, and then from that picked about 27 years old from different social classes. And because it was really a self-fulfilling prophecy, the film, we took, chose from the extremes of social class. So we were in the East End of London, and we were in posh Kensington. And so three weeks later, sure enough, off we went. Paul Armand directed it. And it's interesting looking at that clip, because you can see what the tension was between, particularly between Paul and me, because Paul wanted to make a kind of arty film, in a sense, about children going to school and all this, and I was much more clued in, in a sense, to the politics of it, as, what, as was Gordon. So there was this conflict all the way through between us and him, you know, that we wanted to give it kind of social substance or whatever, and he was in for the art of it. And, and I think the compromise was, was brilliant. You know, it wasn't just a piece of talking heads. It had some real texture to it. But that was it, and so you know, we made it, and it went out, and it was a big success because it was quite funny and sort of ingenuous, but incredibly powerful, what it was saying about the class system. And then you know, it took five years before the penny dropped, before Dennis Foreman came to me. I was still at Granada and said, have you ever thought of going back? And I said, no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> no. so we, we did go back, and it was a, I always like to say it was kind of horrific experience because it was spotty and monosyllabic and teenage, but when you, <laughs> when you put it together, you could see, you know, here was the beginning of a big idea. That's right, and people who write about now who've written about 56 up there, as you're well familiar, and you've acknowledged, um, if you had had a social and political crystal ball um, you would have had more women, you would yeah. have had a better, you would have a wider racial range, but yeah. you were selecting from the... Class system. The I mean, class the system, yeah. Of it, yeah. And there was subsequently, you know, I went on to, in a sense, oversee a Russian and uh, a, a, an American version, and then, of course, that was heaven, because you could put your thinking cap on in your little crystal ball and figure out what was going to happen in these great countries over the next two or three decades, but we were flying by the seat of our pants. And, you know, I had to, you know, make adjustments all the way through because we were so short of, of ladies in the film. Then we beefed up the spouses of some of the men and made them pretty much central to it. But it was a, it's a hard thing to answer because when you say, oh, women weren't important in 1964, you get kind of hurled off the stage and all this. But, <laughs> but you know what I mean. Mm. We're going to alternate in the course of this um, discussion with the clips we've got. We're pretty much alternating documentary and fiction. And um, so we get you launched um, on fiction. We'll give the story of how it happened. This is slightly later in the process. But you had the, um, the luck, as I would see it, the, the, the privilege of working with one of the great television writers, uh, Jack Rosenthal, um, one of the greatest of all time. And this is one of my favorites from 1970, um, Another Sunday and Sweet F.A. Take it, lad, take it. Take it, lad. Go on, go on, go on. Go on. Well done, lad. Go on, you fuck off. 
out. He was blowing his nose. Yeah, I, I, I was blowing my nose. Well, what's your bloody nose doing up there, then, you flag for offside? He didn't. I didn't. Hey, up the referee's on his back out there. Hey, up the referee's on his back out there. How long was I out? A few seconds. I'll add five seconds on. <laughs> um, perfectly timed for the resumption of the Premiership football yeah, season and the, um, the debate over whether more respect should be shown to referees. Um, Jack Rosenthal, he'd been uh, crucial to the whole process because you had first um, worked on Coronation Street. Yeah, yeah, I did a year on Coronation Street, which was... It's a wonderful story of what Granada was like. I was doing documentaries, I was doing World in Action and things like that, and my close friend Mike Newell was there too, and he went on holiday and he was doing Coronation Street. So I went up to the manager and I said, could I do Newell's holiday relief while he's on holiday? And they said, well, why not? So <laughs> can you imagine that these days? But anyway, so I did it and it went all right, and then I had to go back into documentaries, but uh, you know, that was a kind of the first stepping stone. So I was able then, that was the start of the dual career. Oh, and yeah, his, Jack yeah. was on it, yeah, sorry. No, and that's, uh, that's why I started with chasing Mavericks, because it is very striking when you look back at um, a lot of careers, particularly in your case, you, ha you have the talent, you clearly have the talent, but there are all these little bits of luck and chance yes. that come into it. Yeah, and I've, I've been amazingly lucky, frankly. And I mean, that, the, the, the Jack thing, that was a period at Granada when this was one of the first films they did, as opposed to studio work, and these were... You know, I worked with, with Jack, with Arthur Hopcraft, with Colin Welland, I mean, three of the best writers of their generation. And we were out there, again, by the seat of our pants, making television films with Peter Eckersley, who was running the organization. And so that was just an amazing time to be at Granada. And, you know, I was in the right place at the right time. But you'll hear that as we go along. Mm. And there's sometimes tension between, uh, quite often tension between writers and directors yeah. in television and film, because some writers give very, very precise, as they see it, shot directions and camera directions. What, in Jack's scripts, what, what was his attitude to that? No, he, was, he was great. I mean, he was really collaborative about it and you know, very generous. So he's a generous man, and so was Arthur, and they all were. So there was never, I didn't think, the tension. And I've always liked writers, respected a writer, I was married to a writer and all this sort of stuff. I mean, the only real horror show for me was later on in my life when I became president of the Directors Guild of America. And then we had all this horrendous issues with the Writers Guild of America. And then suddenly everything was polarized and all the issues in television and movies, the status of the writer in both, the status of the director in both. Once it became politicized, it was horrific. But I've always got on well with writers. I've always wanted them to be around. I've never like, taken a script and said, see you later, alligator. You know, I've always tried to do it because you know, I love their perceptions. I also want to know what was in their mind when they did it, when they put it down. We move on 14 years from 7up and we um, revisit the uh, young people, one of whom is in this room, um, in 21up. Have you got a girlfriend? No. Nope. Would you like to have a girlfriend? No. Nope. You understand four Fs? Find them, feed them, and forget them. But with the other F, I'll let you use your own discrimination. <laughs> but, I mean, this one, I tried to do the three Fs, but I couldn't forget her. I'd done the three Fs, and I couldn't forget her. It sounds silly, but that's the only way I can put it. Tell me about the family. I mean, are you fairly closely knit? Well, I love them all. There's not one I don't love more than other, other than my mum, obviously. But your mum is the root of the sort of tree. You love your mum best. So what do you like about living in the East End? It's very sort of real. There's nothing false. I need a police. <laughs> I'm firmly placed, and there's no way I can see getting out. I wouldn't want to get out, really. It's very hard to make it in the East End, because your roots are firmly stuck in the ground. And you've got to have a big, hard pull to get them out. So are there many villains in the East End? Uh, there has been in the time, I suppose. Like, obviously, the originals were, were the Quay twins. We in Ballance Road now, as it goes, they used to live here in, um, in a house they used to call Full Balance. Because it was that hard to get in there, I expect. Do you have much to do with villains? I can't say I have much to do. I wouldn't, I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm a villain myself. I don't go vegan or I don't do anybody any harm, fighting-wise. I'm trying to say that. 
wherever you go there's villains and whether you mix with them or not, I mean it's up to you. Does it worry you the possibility of becoming one of them? How can I, how can I become a villain? If it's not in there, if it's not born in there, you won't become one. But don't you think you're going to regret not having education? Where does that come into it? It doesn't come into it in my mind. Education is just, it's just a thing to say, my son is higher than him or my son had a better background than him. I mean, I'm, I'm as good or even better than most of them people, especially on this programme. <laughs> well, the reason I wanted to show this clip, um, this is a cautionary tale because this, this was me doing 21, trying to be God. I kind of assumed that he would get into trouble in life, that uh, at 28 I would be interviewing him in Parkhurst or something like that. So I did this ridiculous sequence, which you've just seen, of him floating around the East End telling about the craze and Jack the Hat and all this sort of stuff. And of course it didn't come true and uh, it was a very embarrassing for me and you know, potent lesson about don't play God, um, which is it's a difficult thing because when you're you know, presented with generations, you want to, I suppose, in your mind, want to get continuity. So what they said at 21, what are they going to say about it in 28? But this was a very telling lesson to me that you can't do that. What you have to do is start all over again. You have to see them as they are in front of you at the time, and then it doesn't matter what happened in 21, 14, whatever. You just have to take each generation as it comes and take it for what it is and don't try and look ahead, don't try and be clever about it. On the other hand, though, the, the people are always the same, and it, it always strikes me, strikes me when I watch them that if in fiction you said to a director, you can cast a group of actors, but then you will have to work with them every seven years, right. um, it would be a nightmare because you would start to hate some of them, and they would start to hate you. Presumably that does has happened, that some of them are keener on you and vice versa than well, others? I mean, I always put, compare it to a family, really. I mean, I know it makes you throw up, but I mean, you know, some of the family you get on with well, some you see a lot. I mean, I don't think any of us hate each other at all. Some of them don't like me at all. I get annoyed by me and a bit vice versa, but I think there's a bond between us, you know, and I, I think in some ways we're always pleased to see each other, even if some, sometimes the agenda is tricky and, and whatever, and they're unhappy about what's gone before. But it is like a family. We do have a kind of bonding, I think. We've been through this so long. And, you know, I think we're there for each other, if you know what I mean. And do you do all the interviews always? Yeah, I mean, I work with Claire. Claire has more contact with them. Claire Lewis, she's been with me since 28. I mean, she keeps abreast of things because I live in the United States and she lives here. So she's crucial in this and she interviews one or two people who really don't like me enough so they won't be interviewed by me. <laughs> Young John doesn't like me so he won't be interviewed by me. But yes, I do the interviews and uh, you know, she does a lot of the heavy lifting and keeping in touch. We, we don't hound them, we don't make it a, an issue to see them every year or whatever. But They've all got the hang of it, and if things are changing, they let us know. But, you know, Claire is sort of indispensable. And it always worried me that I don't live in England and don't really know what's going on so much. Was I out of touch? But, you know, that, I think, sometimes it's a better thing to have a kind of distance from it when I approach this. And you mentioned the uh, penny-dropping moment with Dennis Foreman yeah. when he said, why not go back to them? Presumably by 21, you were thinking, we will do this for as long as we can. Oh yeah, as soon as we did 14. But the, what's so sad about us is we never figured out, I just keep thinking, why didn't we do, say, a Northern Ireland one or something like that? Mm -hmm. And we didn't really go international until 28 Up, which was the first of the ups, which was got an international audience. And then, you know, we decided that we would start one in Russia and start one in America. Fiction, again, with um, one of the most successful and still signature films of your career, The um, Coal Miner's Daughter, The Biopic, um, with Sissy Spacek as Loretta Lynn. All right, y'all, we've got one more pie left. It, it's a chocolate pie here, belonged to Loretta Webb. Who's going to bid first? I bet two bits. Two bits, buddy, that's an insult. <laughs> Who's gonna start it off for a dollar? Who'll give me a dollar now? I guess I get it to you. Heck, I'll bet a dollar, buddy. You, the auctioneer, you ain't supposed to bet. Oh, all right, that's a dollar once, that's a dollar twice. Hey, dollar down. Three dollars. That ain't fair, he's cheap. All right, that's three dollars once, three dollars twice. Three 
375. 377. Five dollars. <laughs> Once, twice, so Mr. Little in five dollars. All, um, all, all directors, they have their ups and downs, and I think people who don't do it are always interested in this. I mean, the previous year, you'd had Agatha, which was perhaps not as happy an outcome. Do, mm -hmm. do, you, do you generally know when working on a film what the outcome's going to be? No, no. And I, I didn't with this one, and nor did the studio. They sold this to, to the airlines before it opened. <laughs> <laughs> and we did two previews with it. One we did in Boston, and nobody showed up, and I have this memory of the head of Universal screaming in the lawyer, in the, in the lobby about why hadn't got shown up. And then we went to Tennessee to preview it and we had to play it twice because the audience wouldn't go away. But this, you know, this, why I was lucky that this was my first American film is this is direct lineage to Jack Rosenthal and Arthur Hopcraft. Because I, I think I learned from the great period of the 60s, from Loach, from McTaggart, all these people, and from Jack and whatever, that if you shoot on a location, you know, and I was a Londoner, I came up to Manchester, and we did all these stuff on film, was you don't just shoot it on location, you put the people of the place on film, you put the voice of it. And why this film was successful was, all the other films in this area had all been Hollywood movies, even if they'd been brilliant films, you know, like Nashville or whatever. But I, because of who I was and what I'd learned and all I knew, had an opportunity to take a film like this and shoot it out there. The only th there are only three people in the whole film who'd ever acted before, Sissy, Tommy, and Beverly D'Angelo. No one had ever acted. And I shot the whole thing on location. We even recorded the music live on location, them singing. The studio was, went crazy. They didn't even realize what I was doing until I'd already started it, because they had no real interest in the film, because they'd get the money back on the album. Mm -hmm. But it was those lessons I learned in English television that helped me with this. And of course, there was something about this movie that seemed authentic to an American audience, and they embraced its authenticity, and it did extremely well. But it was lucky for me that that happened to be the first film I got asked to do in America. It could have been one of many other things when I would have been competing directly with a Hollywood or New York mentality, but I was able to bring something, my documentary experience, to something like this, and it paid off for me in spades. And as you say, huge success, um, large number of Oscar nominations, um, and yet during those disa apparently disastrous uh, previews, trial screenings, yeah. uh, studio reaction, did you retain confidence? No, no, I mean, I, I, mean, I knew in my heart that it had an audience, but I didn't ever realize how big an audience. So, and, when it, and it got very mixed reviews. You know, so some people found it unintelligible and all this. I don't think you ever know. And I, I always think, I say to people, it is a question of timing. I mean, this film was made at exactly the right time. You know, the zeitgeist was in the air. Willie Nelson, Dolly Parton, all of them were entering the mainstream. And so this hit at the exact time. I did another film, Gorky Park. Mm -hmm which was made at exactly the wrong time. It was made before Gorbachev. It was when Andropov was president of the Soviet Union. No one was least bit interested in, you know, in the enemy. And so they could care less about some detective running around Moscow. So that was the wrong time and no one was interested in the film at all. This was the right. So it is a question of luck and you can, whoever you are, the head of a studio or a director or a writer, you never know when your movie is gonna hit the zeitgeist. And sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. And even Agatha had been another example of this, and people commented right. on this, the, um, how often you have a female protagonist. Yeah. Was that policy? Yeah, I mean, it was. It was. I mean, it comes from, you know, I had a strong mother and uh, an angry mother because uh, she was a mother that, you know, had to give up any efforts at a career. But though she was a very smart woman, she, you know, had to bring up a family and all that sort of stuff. And I was always very aware, sympathetic of that. So I was very attracted you know, to women who had the conflict between careers and family. And, and I felt the biggest revolution I lived in my lifetime, 
and I say this to an American audience because I never grew up in Vietnam or civil rights, was the incredible change of roles in society of women. That was the biggest social revolution I've lived through. And so in some ways that's always interested me as a, as a central issue and tons of work I've done has been about that in some way or another. So it really is a conscious agenda, yeah. Even so, you wouldn't have been allowed to have a female James Bond, but when you go on to the next film we're going to look at, which is um, The World Is Not Enough, there was indeed a female villain. And having said previously, being a British director going to make a quintessentially American subject, you then took on this quintessentially uh, English, British franchise. <laughs> Well, the reason I like that, if I could, is I always say to people that every film I do, I have a documentarian soul in it because, you know, that, that was based on real location, this amazing place of Azerbaijan. I read about it, how the Russians were still so full of steel, they didn't want to do with it. So they built a city on the, on the, on the, on the Caspian Sea you know, as a basis to get gas and oil out of it. And we were struggling because the film is about gas, the Bond film. So I thought, well, let's look into the reality of it. And so we found these amazing places and we shot a little bit there, but we built some of them, these amazing places built on the sea. So even doing something as silly as Bond, uh, in my documentary heart beats strongly in it. <laughs> you, say, you say as silly as Bond, but it's interesting this, that um, Danny Boyle, when he was interviewed after the Olympic opening ceremony, he was asked, did he, was it true he wanted to do a Bond film? Sam Mendes is doing one. Yeah. You were at the beginning of this, without being too unfair to them, there were, there were Bond directors. There were people who did two or three of yes, the films yeah. in a row. And then really you were the beginning of what is now the case, is that they go for someone who has a reputation elsewhere and they do one movie. Yeah, I mean, uh, I would have done another one, but I got uninvited because there was a change of management at uh, <laughs> MGM. But I was asked because they wanted to try and frankly encourage a female audience into, into the thing. They wanted to put women more in it. They wanted to get more out of Judy Dench. They liked the idea of having a woman villain and all this. So, Because when they rang me up and asked if I would go and talk to them about it, I truly thought it was a joke because, I mean, I'd never done anything remotely like it. But it was, it was a wonderful, actually, experience just to learn. I mean, I was in my 50s when I did this, and just to learn all this new stuff, you know, visual effects, high-grade high special effects, it was a fantastic experience, you know. And, and so I, whether I brought something to it, I don't know, but that was the agenda. We now jump to 49 Up. In the interim, quite a lot has happened, both in the lives um, of the children, but also in the life of the series, because it had nipped over to the BBC for one... Um, uh, installment because ITV let it go. There were the spin-off uh, programs in America and Russia. But then back at ITV, um, we have 49 up. Does your temper get you into trouble? You're probably the best one to answer that, does it? I mean, you and I have had arguments on occasions. <laughs> Did you meet enough men before you decided who to marry? I mean, what do you mean by settle down? I mean, if, if, you, if you think that getting married, as far as we're concerned, is a case of going to work, coming home, cook tea for hubby, going to bed, coming, getting up, going to work, you, you're totally mistaken. <laughs> the whole thing you... I like it when you shout at me. I'm not sure you do, really. I mean, I don't know. What happened at 21? You asked me if I'd had enough experience with men before I got married. And I thought that was actually an insulting question, and I got very angry and we actually stopped filming because of it. And if you look at the tapes of me at 21, I'm sitting and, and to all intents and purposes, I might as well have not been there. But I was really angry that you even thought you could get, you wouldn't have asked some of the other people in this program that question. <laughs> you will edit this program as you see fit. 
I've got no control over that. You definitely come across as, this is your idea of what you want to do and how you see us, and that's how you portray us. This one may be, may be the first one that's about us rather than about your perception of us. Now, two, two crucial questions, I think, there, and it was also apparent in 56 Up, which is that it became more and more apparent, certainly to the viewer, that um, the crucial decision was you had this huge archive that was building up, and it was to what extent you used that archive visually, those sequences, which are poignant and often quite upsetting, where you flash back through the years at seven-year intervals, but also increasingly it reflected the relationship of the interviewees with you and with the series. Mm. Well, I, I think it was a developing and important ingredient. I mean, the dynamic between us has changed dramatically because I'm 15 years older than them. But as we've got older, the age difference is completely reduced. I mean, before it was a kind of parent-child thing, then I was the older brother and all this sort of stuff. And, you know, as our ages have closed up, I think we're more in intimate with each other. So what other. are you now, the ex-husband? Yeah, sometimes, yes, yeah. or, the, <laughs> or the brain-damaged husband, or the dead husband. <laughs> but, but anyway, I mean, I've always sort of encouraged this, this interplay because they make very valid points. I mean, Jackie, who I can curse at because she's nowhere near here, so I'm safe from her, but she's been pretty tough, and some of the others have, but I think it's all fair comment. I mean... Because going back to the Tony point of without trying to predict what's going to happen and try and set it all up so it becomes self-fulfilling, the other issue is how do I deal with this massive material? You know, it could go a thousand ways. And I just, you know, my argument is what I've learned doing it over the years is, is to try not to be judgmental, um, not to impose my neurotic middle-class values on them, which was a hard thing and a difficult thing to learn. But... And people sort of look at me blankly when I say it, but I mean, when I do these interviews, I sort of do them with a blank, sh you know, I don't prepare them. I don't even know necessarily what, I mean, Claire and I, what areas we're going to go, but it's, I start with a blank page. I don't start with all those bells, all those memories of the other ones, just who are they now and what do they believe in and try not to be judgmental. And, you know, I, I, all I can say is that all through the years, there have been they made complaints and all that, but none of them have dropped out because of this. None of them have said to me, "You made such a shit mess of my life on on Fur. I'm never going to do it again." But Jackie's right. You know, it is my judgment. But that's true in all documentaries. I mean, I have wonderful arguments at events like this. In a sense, when I'm d bringing a movie out, and and then they want to say, "Well." how do you do it after doing a documentary? Because a documentary is something pure about a documentary, whereas a, a movie is contrived. I say, that's the biggest load of bollocks I've ever heard. Every edit you make in a documentary is a judgment value. And people go parading around saying there is something pure and innocent and truthful about documentaries, uh, speaking out of their backsides, in a sense. Because, I mean, I did have a wonderful period in life when I did, at the same time, a documentary and a movie about the same subject. And that was very telling to search. Which was? Thunderheart and Instant Oglala. It was about the American Indian movement on, on Pine Ridge Reservation in the 70s. I made it in, in the 90s. So there was a terrible bust up between the Native Americans and the FBI. And I learned that in documentaries, you can, there's a visceral quality to it. You're seeing things for the first time. But in a movie, you can be much more complicated. You can cover many more textures to it because you have more, you know, more control over you know, what's being said and what's being done. You can't match that kind of vividness of a documentary, but in a documentary, sometimes you just can't get the complexity that you can get into the telling of a piece of fiction. All um, directors, I think, have projects that don't perhaps um, achieve the impact that they hoped, and I think this is what we'll talk about um, uh, after this. This is um, from 2006, and this is the uh, biopic of William Wilberforce and the fight against slavery, Amazing Grace. As representative of the great and flourishing commercial town of Liverpool, I must once again remind the House that we have no evidence that the Africans themselves have any objection to the trade. I have here an account written by a Mr. Clutterbuck, which states that most slaves in the Indies have a snug little garden with plenty of pigs and poultry. There are many poor families in Liverpool. 
Liverpool who do not have as much. <laughs> which, which is why, apart from a few mendicant physicians and itinerant clergymen, the ordinary people of Britain are not at all exercised by the whole issue of slavery. <laughs> The member for Liverpool seeks evidence of people's concern. In the past year, I and my itinerant clergyman friends have been gathering just such evidence. We have taken a petition calling for the abolition of the slave trade to all the great cities of this country. It has been signed by over 390,000 people. You mentioned the, um, the political interest and hunger you had when you were a researcher on 7up. And extending up to this, I mean, this is, this is the political side of your mm -hmm. career. I mean, it's an example yes, of that, yes. Yeah. Yes, and um, I, yes, I didn't know what question you were going to ask me. But yeah, yes, this is something I wanted to make. It, I, I, it was a sort of love letter, in a sense, to a country of my birth, because I had been looking for a political film, but it was, it was, it's very hard to find something that doesn't be, isn't sort of self-caricaturing or whatever, um, because I think politics is very important. I think people should pay attention to politics. You do so at your risk. But making a film about politics, I, in a sense, so you can get slightly objective about it and so you don't have to get involved in the issue, as it were, which you would do with a contemporary film. The point about this film was that, you know, the, the, Finally, the destruction of the slave trade was started with this thing, this, the passing of the Anti-Slave Trade Act, which was a purely political move. It wasn't a grassroots thing, it was a political move, and uh, Wilberforce and his chums did all sorts of maneuvers and spent 20 years getting the thing passed. And I just thought it was a story of how powerful politics could be. Politics not just as a pure thing, but politics as an everyday workmanlike thing, you know, deviousness, um, you know, vision and whatever. It was a purely political film. And so that's why I wanted to do it to, in a sense, give a, an interesting little drama about how powerful politics per se can be. And it isn't something you should just dismiss and trash. And although, you know, it does it, it's best to sort of immolate itself, politicians and politics. But, you know, there is a, it's hugely important that we have an attentive and informed political life. Before we reach 56 up and open it up um, to the audience, we talked about the good and bad luck, ups and downs that directors have. Um, a couple of other things we'd probably mention. Um, Rome, Rome was yes. bad luck in the end, wasn't it? Your... Well, it was the weirdest. It was a horrible time. It ended up being very successful, and HBO bitterly regretted cancelling it. Um, no, I went into it. Uh, they'd, they, you know, I, I was hired. They'd already pre started preparing it. They made a ghastly business decision to shoot it in Rome, which was a complete fiasco. So all the time, we were totally behind the eight ball. Um, I won't even begin to tell you the financial numbers of it, what it was when I went in and what it was by the time the series ended. But no, I was in the eye of the storm of having to try and create this world in the back of Chinichita um, and being frankly up against it. And you know, it was sort of disastrous. The whole experience was disastrous. And, and whatever, and everybody thought the whole thing was a gigantic turkey from beginning to end and would destroy the management of HBO, and then it came out, and it was successful. And by the second series, it was a hit, but it was so expensive. They took a third, two-thirds of the whole back lot of Chinichita to build it. It was a five-acre set. You had to have a map to get around it. And the rent that HBO had to pay between the first and the second season was so big they decided to cancel it before the second season had come out. To its eternal shame, the BBC recut it, to my intense irritation, without telling me. I only discovered it when it went on the air. They cut a whole hour out of the three hours I did because they thought it was too political. They wanted all the sex and violence. And even though you were president, president of the Directors Guild, you couldn't do anything about that? No, I mean, I, mean, I wasn't fired off the thing. I just... Never, never really finished it, you know, and then they shut it down and then they brought it back and other directors who were hired to do it, um, um, you know, picked up the bits of scenes that I hadn't done. But it, it was a very 
painful experience. But no, I mean, the HBO were perfectly within their legal rights to do whatever they did. No, but the BBC to re-edit it, they could do that, could they, without any... Yeah, I mean, I really had a go at them about it. They said, oh, we didn't know. Oh, my God, that's terrible. Oh, Michael, is sorry. But, I mean, <laughs> it was so insulting to the British audience, for mm. Christ's sake, you know? I mean, they kept every piece of dirt and violence that they did, and they said the politics are too difficult for an audience to understand. Well, the, the great unwashed American public seemed to get it all right. So I thought that was a piece of editorializing. On the, and I love uh, the BBC has been very good to me, but on, on that instance, I thought they were, I thought it was a bit over the top, especially as, you know, I'm, I wasn't trained there, but I worked a lot there. So I was a, a kind of fellow traveler. They might have said, Michael, um, we're going to have to do this, blah, blah, etc. but whatever. Another oddity in your career, you have a whole Rolling Stones project that has never been seen. That's another, you're really, yes I am, that was bitter. Um, <laughs> not, not without warning in a sense, I mean it, I was asked if I would do, I'd, I'd done, Mick Jagger had produced Enigma, this film about, I did about code breaking, he and I got on well enough, so I was invited to do a film about their 40th anniversary, the, uh, the, the 40th anniversary of, of the band, and so they gave me access to a lot of time with them. I, I was with them, the whole idea of the film that I sold to them was to, for, I would shoot the preparations and then the end of the film would be the opening of the, of the tour, which is an interesting idea from their point of view. They were opening in cities in three different venues, in a club, in a stadium, in an arena. So they were having to have three different you know, shows, as it were. So I did all that and I spent a bit of time in Paris with them, then six weeks in Toronto while they rehearsed and it was fascinating. And then I covered their opening three concerts in Boston. And it was fascinating because they had so many songs to play because they had to change, you know, the lineup. They were playing songs they hadn't played for 30 years, but anyway. So I did the film and I, and I showed them a very rough cut and Mick saw it and all that and said, fine, finish it. So <laughs> I finished it and then I took it, to, I'll never forget it, to, to Las Vegas to show him. And he said, this is, we can't have this. This is, just not, this is not doing the band any good. And he hired his hit man in to, to deal with it. And he said, I, I want you to go back and think about it. And I said, no, I want you to go back and think about it. God knows he was there when I shot it. It wasn't like I'd gone off and done something. So anyway, so he said, I'll tell you what, so just take 20 minutes out of it. It was only 105 minutes. And um, I said, all right. So I did it, and I thought it was horrible. And I sent it back to him, and there was silence. And then eventually came back and said, it's getting better to take another 20 minutes. Out of so I said, <laughs> fuck off. Um, <laughs> and it, what, what was sad about it was, I'm not saying two things. One, there's a history of this. There were lots of other directors who've done the same things, and mm -hmm. only the blandest films had ever made it through, like the Scorsese thing. Mine was good, because it was very emotional. They gave me a lot of contact. Um, you know, Charlie and all of them that gave me, and it was about their lives and their, and what was great about it in a way was you could see they loved playing with each other. They, they were amazing. They would sit while they were waiting. I remember they had this huge arena in New England they were playing, and they came on, they were doing a, you know, a check, and they started making up this blues song. It was beautiful, and I filmed it and all that, and you could just see because they're rappers, you know, they come out of retirement, don't make a big tax killing, make a ton of money. But they were really wonderful playing with each other. And I'd never seen a film about that, which, then I, you know, I said to Mick, he later apologized, he said, thanks a lot. Why did they employ me? I mean, if they wanted, you know, a kind of, uh, you know, YouTube, God, God bless them, YouTube thing, you know, or, you know, MTV thing, well, there's plenty of people who could do that. But, you know, my history in in you know, in documentaries is fairly specific. And that's why I thought they wanted me to do it. And when I delivered it, and I think it showed them in a way that they'd never been seen before, really humanized them, you know, and made them, you know, what they are, which is kind of very interesting men, as well as crazy and all that sort of stuff. So that, as you would say, was a big bad luck. And that can never be shown. Well, I've still got it. Um, I don't think they'd ever released it. I mean, they, they eventually, I think they made up, brought out a four-part DVD thing of the tour, and on the fourth DVD, they put kind of, just to add insult to injury, kind of fans, videos, and they put about 15 minutes of this in it. So I, I, I doubt whether, I occasionally show it to people, because, you know, I thought it was quite, it was never dubbed or anything, so it's a bit of a mess, but that was a real disappointment. We catch up with ourselves and reach 2012 and 56 up. 
Well, my girlfriend is in Africa, and I won't. I don't think I'll have another chance of seeing her again. You want a girlfriend? No, no, not yet. I'm sure it will come, but not yet. I mean, I do think a lot of people think too much about it. I think I would very much like to um, oh, become involved in a family, my, my own family, for a start. That's a, a need that I feel I ought to fulfil and would like to fulfil and would do it well. Yes, I haven't got married or whatever. And I was supposing, you know, that, that would have been something which I hoped had happened. Well, you're getting on a bit, you're getting worried. Well, not particularly. I mean, I'm always optimistic. I mean, who knows I'm, who I might meet tomorrow. And in the middle of a conversation about something completely different, he just asked if, um, if I'd like to marry him. And if I hadn't been listening carefully, I would have missed it completely. To love and to cherish. To love and to cherish. Till death us do part. Till death us do part. Don't argue very much. Not really. I mean, we haven't really had a sort of full-blown row. No, you know, just our think... arguments sort of tend to be <clears throat> two sentences and I go off and salt for 24 hours. So is Bruce getting any better at expressing his feelings to you? Um... Not, not really, by the sound of that. <laughs> <laughs> so that's an example of one of the most thrilling sequences, because that's the full eight, yeah, as we yeah. might call it, which might ultimately become the full nine, ten, yes. whatever. Um, people watching the later ones, we tend to think, once we get past a certain age, most people in their 50s, if they think back to their primary school class, there's somebody who's died, and yeah. we watch each one wondering if that's going to happen. Yeah. Um, thankfully, but remarkably, I, it, they are all still there, aren't yeah. they? Yeah, I think it probably is remarkable, but thankfully, yes. Mm. I mean, I dread that. Mm. And the question that you inevitably face, being 15 years older, is that when they're 85, you'll be 100. Yes, and, um, I'm ready for it. Send yeah. me in, coach. And I thought, <laughs> I, worked, I worked it out, uh, when they're 84 up, I'll be 99, which would be a, a nice uh, closure, wouldn't it? It would. Yeah. Uh, seriously, you have to think about this. Have you thought, of, you have thought about oh, whether yeah. it would go on after you? Oh, well, I mean... I'd hope it would. I don't know. I mean, I'm sure Claire could take it over, drop of a hat. No, I, I'm not so worried about that. I'm only worried if I lose someone before I go. Mm. You know, it's, I mean, it is. But it would be horribly emotional, wouldn't it? Oh, it would be yeah. impossible. Yeah. I can't even think about it without wanting to cry. Um, if we could take uh, questions from the audience. They're threatening to actually take down that wall at 5.30, but I'm going to try to run... Um, down, run a little bit past it because through no fault of our own we started we have to start late so we got microphones which you can wait I for. just want to apologize to my family for some of my bad language that I was using <laughs> but it, it was it was your fault you said express yourself I did yeah. I'm sorry you just blame me please. Yes. Um, if anyone would like to make a comment um, if you want to reveal yourself as a as one of the um, group yes uh, it's Jason Stone from the drum um, one thing I've really noticed about the last couple of uh, instalments of the fabulous documentary we've been making all these years, and I think we saw it in the clip from 49 Up, is that you've allowed their voices to challenge the whole notion of the sort of legitimacy of it. Mm -hmm. And I just wondered um, how you feel about that. Well, no, I, I embrace it. I mean, I'm not being narcissistic about it. I think it gives tremendous life to it, and I think they, they answer questions or make points that, if I didn't make them in the film, would be brought up anyway in events like this. So I, I think you know, we have to take the rough with the smooth, uh, and although I never appear in the programme, because that was the style we set out on, and I think it would be incredibly jarring to, to, to change that. I, I think you know, their reservations about it and their opinions about it are incredibly important. I mean, it gives the film a, a kind of another level, I think, and, and a, a sort of authenticity about it, as though I'm not, a, you know, I'm not avoiding, the film is not avoiding the big questions. I mean, everybody says, has it affected their lives? Well, I tried that in 42. I asked all of them that question. 
And, you know, you got such a plethora of response. It was unbelievable from people saying, well, it's the greatest gift because here's our lives documented to, you know, the famous one of it's a pill, a bit of, a pill of poison. So it covered the whole spectrum. Yes, I do do things. I have to think, God, what am I going to do? Because he's coming next year. I better think, think of something to, to do. And others who say, well, we just take it. So, you know, I just felt it's always my obligation to really air their views, you know, and, I mean, if, if, I, if I think they are relevant and whatever, which again means I editorialize it, I suppose, but I embrace it and I think it's also, I think it's good fun for the audience too. Thank you, yes. Who would um, anybody else like to? Yes, if we could get the microphone across to the middle of that row. Um, hi, thank, thanks. Um, Given the beauty of this, the narrative structure of dipping into people's lives once every seven years, do you have a take on the fact that Facebook now means we receive hourly updates on people's <laughs> lives to the point of saturation? What, what yeah. do you think about that? Well, because I, I have that lead over all of you. I mean, everybody. I mean, we, we unwittingly created a whole genre of documentaries. I mean, I can take you back to these seven-year-olds. Facebook can't do that. I mean, that's the ace in my hand, and which is the difficult thing of cutting the film together, because we have such a lot of material, is what I've got that no one else has ever had, or ever will have, in my opinion, is that depth of you know, lineage to it, you know, that you can watch these people grow up, and that reporting every hour on people's lives is not the same as this. And so my problem is, you know, I have to junk, I reckon of 56 up, I'll junk 80% of it next time. And there are great sequences like the one you saw with Jackie and me, which I just didn't have time to put into 49 because, you know, I've got to preserve those iconic moments from all those generations. If I start cutting that down or cutting that short, or then I'll lose my greatest gift in a sense, which is this whole generational thing of watching people's lives change in front of you. And no Facebook on the planet can take that away from me. I think the gentleman was also suggesting that it's turned out, and it's part of the genius of Dennis Foreman, that the seven-year gap oh. is about right. Because if you think if you went every two years would be ludicrous, yes. ten would yeah. be too long. Yeah. But yeah. seven no, is a good gap, isn't I it? I beg his pardon. Mm. Yeah, no, it, it was. I mean, but again, it, that was built into the original, even though we didn't know what we were doing. It was still that Jesuit thing. Yeah. Give me a child until he is a ma until he is seven, I'll show you the man. So that was that apocalyptic number was built into it. So it wasn't, I can't give Dennis too much credit, God bless him, but it was built into the original, even if we, you know, we never even paid attention to it, seriously. But no, I, I beg your pardon. Thank you for the generous question. I get anxiety when I hear Facebook. Um, <laughs> but no, it did, it did happen to be a good time, yeah. And I've only ever once sort of gone, out, gone uh, sort of dishonored it when, um, Bruce got married and Neil went to his wedding and that was not in the seventh year, but I thought that was too, too excellent a, a, an opportunity to miss. That was the only time I've been unfaithful to the... To the to my yes. Um, hi. The thing that, uh, when I'm watching, always strikes me is that you're obviously very emotionally involved with these people and some of them have got problems, whether they're health or financial. Do you... How do you leave them? Do you feel like you have to help them, or what happens afterwards in the gap? Well, I mean, it's a, it's a very kind of tightrope, this whole longitudinal stuff, because I, I hardly dare say this in front of this present audience, but really I'm over a barrel. I, I, if I misbehave, they won't come back. I mean, if you do a document, regular one, you'll say to someone, no, we won't use that, we won't use that, and then you use it if you think it's for the greater good. But with this, you can't do that, because if you dishonor them, if you break that trust, then... And, I mean, they all lay out in their own way certain perimeters. And, you know, we have certain values as well, Claire and I, about what we put into it. But they lay out perimeters, things they absolutely don't want to talk about. And, you know, even if I want to talk about it, there's nothing I can do about it. They don't want to talk about it. Or if they come back to me and say, please don't use that, we regret saying that, then I have to honor that. And some of them want to see the film before it's broadcast and give me notes. And others, you know, trust me with it. But, you know, it's, you know, it's, a, very, it's a very tricky ground, this, you know. But again, since this whole thing is built on trust, you know, I have to honor what they want. In some places, they don't want me to go. And some places, they will let me go. And 
that really is, those are the perimeters that are set there in a, in a sense. And I try my luck, I'm cheeky. I'll push them on something and then you know, they'll shut up or they'll say, you said you wouldn't ask that, so please don't use it. So you know, it has a built-in kind of editorializing anyway. And if someone says take it out, you, uh, sorry, Jackie, yes. Uh, we should introduce, uh, th this is the hidden uh, member the of hidden the group, of Jackie. Up. Um, just to go on that, it is totally a trust thing. Um, we've used the same crew virtually since seven. And because of that, we know that we can trust them. And if we didn't trust them, believe me, he wouldn't get through the front door. Because, and that's why I think if anything happens to Michael and Claire, the programme will stop because I don't think I would trust anyone the way I trust those two. And whilst, as you've seen, Michael and I have had our differences, that's something, that's the issues, that's not Michael and I, that's the issues we're arguing about. So it is a family, very much so a family, but there are areas he tries to push on and he gets stopped. <laughs> Definitely. No, but, but you, can't, you can't talk about things that are going to hurt the rest of your family. So you can't do that. And Michael being Michael and, and doing the job he, he's doing, tries to go there. And I say no, and that's it, he respects that. But other than that, it, it's totally down to trust. We couldn't do the programme without that trust. And Michael, if someone says, take it out, you always would take it out, would you? No, I might fight them on it. I might, I might you know, say, look, you know, this is important. I certainly do. It's like any collaborative thing. If I'm doing a movie for a studio, they give me hundreds of pages of notes, I fight them, but at the end, they will win. Um, they are, we're in the period where they may take that wall down, but we'll take as many um, questions. Anybody? Yes, there's um, a lady there with her hand raised. And anyone on that side who'd like to? No, OK. Um, every time I watch it, I think, what happened to the rough cut and where are the rushes? Because there are so many different versions you could cut of each... Yeah. Each episode, you know, and I'd love to know where they are and what are you going to do with them? Well, they're, they're all there and people have asked us, well, why don't you just make them available on the internet? But we could only do that, you know, with the permission of the people involved in it because we have so much material, it's staggering. And, and from 21 upwards, it's all digitised and kept. And sometimes I go back into stuff maybe that we've never used before, not very often, but now again, if something comes up, and I go back into it, but it all still exists. Um, but again, when people say, that, wouldn't it be fun to put it all on the internet? Well, it, it might be no. fun for some, but no. I, think, no. I think that... No. that <laughs> no. <laughs> Good BFI or someone like that, yeah. you know, kept in an archive, said, have you used... The, how many editors have you used over the years? Well, one. I mean, Kim Horton's done it. I used two editors on 28, and Kim has been with me ever since. Like, as Jackie says, George Turner shot it since 21. Yeah. Claire's been on it, the sound, Nick Steer's been on it since 21, 28. I've always kept that because it's a part of all our lives. And you know, again, it gives that feeling of intimacy and, event, and the feeling that we're all in this together. So you know, I've kept the same crew as long as I possibly can and will continue to do so. I, I bring George out of retirement now to do it. So, <laughs> you know, because again, as Jackie says, it is trust. Uh, I mean, if I was offered the greatest camera, documentary camera in the world, I wouldn't take him. I would take George over that because of what George brings to us, which is that intangible thing of trust, you know. Um, we're going to have to finish here. Just very briefly on that, the question of the archive, because clearly it is this amazing anthropological and yeah, social document yeah. now. U ultimately, it should go to some kind yes, of Yes, and what's today. great about it is it's all owned by one source, you know, by mm. Granada Television yeah. and ITV, so that would be in there. Be be bequest what to do with it, but I'm sure it will land up somewhere. But I, it just can't be indiscriminately put on the internet, I don't think, because, as I said, it would be very destructive to the people involved. Thank you very much for that uh, fascinating hour with Michael. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.